So what our group does, um, I like to say that we kind of work backwards from the big problems, right? They're big problems, like can we understand how networks of neurons work together to implement a, a thought or an intelligent behavior? Can we figure out how cells and molecules within cells work together to store memory, right? Can we figure out how even maybe neurons and non-neuronal body parts, right, you know, interact, right? People are now studying how bacteria in the gut might influence cognition and so on. So how do we wrestle with this immense complexity? <coughs> is this the room mic? This is the room mic, okay. What I'm gonna do is if I cough, I'm gonna try to disconnect right away. <coughs> I'm gonna put it back on. <coughs> is I think that's faster than muting it. Okay. So one reason why the brain is so hard to understand is that the brain operates across vastly different spatial and temporal scales. A brain circuit is a large thing, right? We have many neurons that extend centimeters, if you count down the spinal cord, even a meter uh, in length. And yet, the actual connections between cells and the molecules at those connections that govern what neural connections do are nanoscale in dimension. And so you arguably, if you want to understand a brain circuit, you need to understand what those nanos nanoscale building blocks look like and what they're doing, but across these vast scales, which is really, really, really difficult. The other big problem with the brain is time. So the briefest events in the brain, millisecond time scale electrical events, such as the action potential, um, millisecond timescale releases of chemicals, such as neuro neurotransmitters, are really brief. But if you want to understand how a memory forms, or how, or how Alzheimer's disease progresses, or how you know, um, uh, different kinds of, of uh, you know, acquisition of a skill occur, these take years to occur sometimes. And so you have these vastly different temporal scales between the briefest events that make the brain do what it does, and the long timescale events that you know, especially in humans, give us a lot of the attributes that, that make us interesting. So in our group, our approach is really to think about how do we work backwards from the vastly different spatial and temporal scales that need to be understood to understand brain operation, which are sort of the big classes of question we think about. And then we survey all of engineering, chemistry, photonics, microfabrication, you know, you name it. And then, and only then, do we start actually inventing tools to analyze and fix brain circuits. And so today I wanna to tell you three short stories, one on mapping the brain, one on recording the dynamics of the brain, and one on controlling the dynamics of the brain and how uh, these tools work and how they're being applied, um, sometimes you know, at very early stages to try to reveal the substrates of computation such as those that can implement intelligent behavior. So let's start with mapping. Um, mapping is one of the most difficult things to do because you again have to map these gigantic volumes but with nanoscale precision. <clears throat> and so many attempts have been made to try to tackle this. In fact, last year, some of the inventors of so-called super resolution imaging methods won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for their work. Um, but nevertheless, although it's now possible to see very small things, these technologies don't go fast enough to let you image large objects with that small degree of precision. So in our group, we started thinking about this about, um, actually about eight years ago. Uh, how do we possibly understand a large object with nanoscale precision? And we decided that the problem with nanoscale imaging is that a lot of the tricks people use <coughs> are very slow, but regular imaging, you know, I think, you know, um, if you look on like a phone, there's a very inexpensive camera that's part of it. And that thing can ac acquire some significant fraction of a gigapixel every second, right? If you run it in video mode. So if you allow yourselves to use classical diffraction limited optics like lenses and so on, you can go very, very fast. So then the question became, how could you image at really high speeds using cheap optics that's scalable, but still be able to see nanoscale things? Now, if you take your, your uh, a camera, like the one on a phone, it can't see nanoscale things because light has a finite wavelength around you know, a couple hundred nanometers. And so that means you can't really see things that are under that size, which is right where you know, synapses and neurotransmitters and ion channels and receptors get interesting. So we thought, and this is work that's been driven in our group by two graduate students, Fei Chen and Paul Tilburg, why don't we just blow everything, blow everything up and make it bigger? 
And so the concept um, really borrows from 1960s, 1970s polymer chemistry. Back in the day, there was a very interesting and exciting field called responsive polymers or smart gels. And these are polymers that vastly change their shape or size when you expose them to a, an, appropriate, an appropriate environment. So one of these polymers is sodium polyacrylate, which some of you might know is the active ingredient in baby diapers. And it's a very dense polymer. When you add water, the sodium gets washed out. And then what happens? Well, acrylate has a carboxyl group, which has a negative charge. And so if you wash the sodium away, you get all the positive charge out, and the negative charge is stuck behind. And negative charges that are anchored to each other are going to repel each other. But there's really nowhere for them to go except away from each other. And so what happens is, if you have a lot of negative charge on a polymer, it's going to expand and repel. OK. I'm realizing that the tape's going to get everything. So some editing might be required. <clears throat> so what we did was to take a piece of brain tissue and embed it in a dense polymer of sodium polyacrylate. And by embed, I mean that the polymers are winding their way through the tissue, between the molecules, inside the cells, outside the cells, everywhere in the sample. This is obviously a preserved tissue, not a living tissue. And then when we added water, it was pretty striking. This kind of worked on the first try almost. Um, it grew. It physically expanded and became about 100 times bigger by volume. And um, it was pretty, pretty amazing, actually. Now, there were many problems. It took us a couple years to debug this because although the growth could occur, we often had cracking or other problems. And that makes sense, right? The brain has a lot of structure to it. It's not going to just let some piece of baby diaper push it around, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to resist. And so it took us a couple years to develop and refine the chemistry and validate it until we finally arrived at, at what we call expansion microscopy. And here's how expansion microscopy works. The first step is very traditional, right? You preserve the tissue. You do that with tr traditional chemicals. Then you bring in a somewhat complex looking label. shown here. And what we have here are a couple components. One is an affinity tag. That is, it'll bind to a target, a neurotransmitter, a receptor, some kind of biomolecule. The second thing is a fluorophore, a molecule that glows so you can see it. And the final thing is a polymer linking group, something that looks a lot like the actual monomers that make up the polymer chain, but um, allows us to bind to the polymer. And so if you think about it, what this means is we can anchor a fluorophore. Wow, I'm really losing my voice very rapidly right now. We can anchor a fluorophore at a site in the polymer chain that's defined by where the affinity tag bound to its target, right? So you can imagine bringing in an antibody that binds to a neurotransmitter receptor, anchor the fluorophore to the polymer, and now you can do uh, the polymerization and the formation of the polyacrylate mesh. And by the way, the mesh size, the spacing between polymer chains, is really tiny, maybe only a couple nanometers, the size of a biomolecule. Next step, then, we use an enzyme to chop up the tissue gently. And so now all the mechanical structure has been homogenized. There's nothing to resist the expansion. Finally, we add water, and the polymer will swell. So let's go through that with a slightly different set of slides. Here's our, as you can see, very artistic rendition of a neuron. Um, we bring in that antibody or affinity tag to label a particular biomolecule. We form the polymer, and we anchor the fluorophore to the polymer. We digest the original biomolecules to homogenize the mechanical properties. And then when we add water, the polymer swells, taking all of those anchored labels with it. So this works. Here is a, just a cell in a dish. And we've labeled the cytoskeleton with an antibody against tubulin. So these are the microtubules. The blue scale bar means pre-expansion. And this is after expansion. That's what the orange scale bar means. So this is four and a half times bigger in all directions, about 100 times bigger in volume than this picture. 
but we shrank it down so you can compare visually what the two images look like. So they look pretty similar. But you know, we want to be quantitative. And so we adapted from image analysis this uh, vector field calculation. And the way this works is you take your pre-expansion image and your post-expansion image and you overlay them. And then you nudge them just a little bit until they overlay. And the amount of nudging that you do is a local measure of distortion. And the amount of nudging we plotted as this little vector field. So these are tiny little arrows. Then, if we want to calculate the error of a biological measurement, all we have to do is to pick two points in the image and then integrate over that vector field. And when we do that, we can calculate the root mean square error of a, bio of a biological measurement as a function of the measurement length. And it's very, very small around 1%. So for almost all biological and medical measurements, the 1% change in the length is not that important. And most people want to know whether things are nearby, co-localized, their organization, the topology. Um, and I should point out, the dotted line here is the resolution of our microscope. So it's quite possible that we're taking more blame than we need to. But you know, it's a new technology. We want to be as conservative as possible in our claims. And so even if we take all the blame for the distortion, it's only about 1% or so. Now, what about down to the nanoscale? So to do nanoscale comparisons, we have to take a pre-expansion image using an older super-resolution method. So these, of course, are very slow, but you know, they work. And then after expansion, we take an image on a regular microscope. And then you can actually zoom in and analyze the distortion the same way. So if we calculate the root mean square error as a function of measurement length, we get an error of around 60 nanometers or so. We can also, because we know the size of these microtubules, compare before and after. If you draw a line through the microtubules in this area before expansion, it looks really blurry. But if you draw the same line after expansion, you see three peaks. That's because there are three microtubules there. And since we know how wide the microtubules are, we can calculate the distortion of our imaging method. And again, you get around 60 nanometers or so. This works in intact brains as well, of course. Otherwise, I wouldn't be telling you. So as you can see here, this is a piece of mouse brain. And the label that you see that's glowing is yellow fluorescent protein being expressed in a random subset of the cells. And there's a little bit more distortion, around 2 to 4%, because the, the brain has more structure than the cells in a dish. But still, you know, 2 to 4% is negligible for the vast majority of biological and medical measurements. That said, it is important for some measurements, and we are working to make the polymers even more even. So this is now where the fun part begins. We can kind of zoom in. And then maybe turn the lights off here. Is that the right one? I'm not sure. Um, well, here's that piece of brain again. And we're going to zoom in into that little square, which is what you see here. And now you can see two neurons and some purplish fuzz. And then we're going to zoom in on this little square. And now you can see one neuron branch and slightly larger purplish fuzz. That's pre-expansion. Post-expansion, though, you can see that the purplish fuzz is not actually purplish fuzz. There's a blue part and a magenta part. Blue magenta, blue magenta, blue magenta, blue magenta. Those are synapses. And in fact, we can zoom all the way and see a single synapse. The blue is the presynaptic protein bassoon. The magenta is the postsynaptic protein Homer 1a. And um, if you measure the distance between the centers of those, you get exactly what you would expect based upon the classical literature, except that now you can do all these imaging methods using cheap, scalable optics. So the take-home message of this first part of the talk is that now we can do 3D large volume scalable imaging with nanoscale precision. And so here's a piece of the mouse brain, the hippocampus. And we've labeled, again, a random subset of neurons, now shown in green. And then blue and magenta are, again, pre- and postsynaptic molecules, bassoon and Homer 1a. And this is a 30 billion voxel image in three colors taken uh, on a regular microscope just over at the, the Whitehead core facility across the street. 
And we can zoom in onto some branches of neurons and then zoom in onto a single branch. And now if you look carefully, these are dendritic spines, you know, one of the major components of excitatory synapses in hippocampus and cortex, amongst other places. And you can see the magenta postsynaptic densities there. And if you look carefully, the blue presynaptic densities in opposition. And then finally, you can zoom into one synapse. And this is a very interesting synapse. This is one presynaptic terminal. You can see multiple blue parts, though. This is one presynaptic terminal is talking to multiple postsynaptic terminals. And you can see multiple blue spots with multiple magenta compatriots next to it. Now, one nice thing about expanding tissues is that since you're filling them with water, they become completely clear. So here's a piece of mouse brain before expansion, and here it is after expansion. You can't even see the boundary. It's somewhere in here. That's not the brain boundary. That's where the air meets the sample. So somewhere in there is the brain. And it makes sense, right? You're expanding it and filling it with water, so it becomes clear. And when you clear things, then you can even scan faster, right? Because now you can do interesting methods of microscopy, like so-called light sheet microscopy, where you scan a whole sheet of light through, and then you take a picture at 90 degrees to the sheet. So it's like you, just, you know, suppose you have a sample here, we illuminate it from the side, and we just illuminate an entire sheet through it, and then we take a picture from the top. So we can take an entire 2D image at once. So there's all sorts of fun things to look at now. Here are two neurons in the cortex. And the red stains for GAD6567, which is one of the enzymes that make inhibitory neurotransmitters in the brain. And you can see the inhibitory synapses. And you can see how they're arranged on the cell body. Some people think that's because it gives the, the inhibitory neurons a, a kind of veto power over the neural activities. And others have hypothesized that this allows for certain kinds of oscillations or dynamics that are important for attention or for feature selectivity. I always like this image. This is the nucleus of the neuron. So I, you know, in genomics, most people think of the genome as a long string of letters, right? But every one of our cells has like this meter-long string of DNA all wound up in a tiny compartment. And here, we've labeled the nuclear envelope, the boundary of the nucleus. And it has this really weird shape. Part of it is smooth, and part of it is ruffled. And so one idea now, and people have seen these kinds of things in populations of cells before, but now we want to see how it happens at the nanoscale, is how does the, f the genome coil up in three dimensions? You know, does that help us understand how memories are encoded or other changes that are known as epigenetic changes? Now, one of the most exciting, so expansion is exciting for two reasons. One is because you can get nanoscale imaging across 3D volumes. That by itself is pretty cool, if I say so myself. Um, but there's another thing that is only starting to be appreciated. When you move all the molecules in a sample away from each other, you make a lot of room around all of them. And with all that room, you could bring in little barcodes and attach them to different molecules. And so that lets you have essentially an infinite number of colors for your imaging. So most imaging systems only see a couple colors, maybe three, four tops. The really advanced ones maybe can get up to 10, but you know, it's very difficult to do that. Now let's go back to this picture. I glossed over it before, but now I want to go back to it and tell you a different story about it. We have an affinity tag, like an antibody that can bind to a neurotransmitter or a receptor or an ion channel. This molecule here that binds it all together is actually DNA. And if you think about it, you know, DNA encodes information. So imagine that you have like a thousand different tags to bind to a bunch of different ion channels, receptors, transmitters, you name it, everything you want to know about the brain. And each one has a different barcode on it. So, and there's a lot of room around all the molecules, right? So you can take advantage of that room and bring in all these barcodes. So you, you anchor the barcode to the polymer and expand all the barcodes away from each other. And you can read out the barcodes. So there are four kinds of DNA base, A, T, C, G. If you have 10 bases long barcodes, there are four to the 10th power, or one million approximately, different barcodes. You could tell a million different things apart from each other. Now, how do you read the barcode, right? That's obviously a difficult thing to do. So it turns out, 
when you sequence DNA, suppose my arm is DNA, when you sequence DNA, you're copying it. And as you copy it, when you add a new base to the DNA and you copy it, it's fluorescent. And so as you copy a piece of DNA, over time, it's basically blinking out its coat. And so something we are now exploring is whether, and some of this is in collaboration with the Church Lab at Harvard, is whether you could take the barcodes and anchor them, expand them, and then sequence the DNA right there in the sample. You know, not like regular DNA sequencing where you grind everything up and you put it into a machine and it emails you the results a week later. Here you want to image it. You want to see the sequences blink out over time. So then, not only can you see large objects of nanoscale precision, but you might be able to do it with an infinite number of colors, enough to distinguish all the different molecules that make a neuron do what it does. And so one thing that we're starting to think about is whether we could actually map an entire brain, and if we know where the key transmitters, receptors, channels, and so on are, can we actually just simulate it in a computer, right? So, you know, uh, can we really get down to the fundamental circuits and mechanisms and see how they actually operate? To do that, of course, we're going to need to expand much bigger. And so we are working to make the expansion bigger, um, although this is still a very early stage. So that's the end of part one on mapping. Great question. Yeah, can we catch information that we don't know we're looking for? It's very difficult, because if you don't have an, aff an affinity tag that binds it, how do you really know that you're going to get it? So I would say that's a very difficult problem. I think what's going to happen is, suppose we can map a brain circuit. We try to simulate it in a, in a computer. It can recapitulate some features, but not others. OK, now we have to make a hypothesis. Maybe it's nitric oxide or gap junctions. or There's a lot of stuff that the cellular neuroscientists have discovered. right? We have to then build a tag to label those you know, and then repeat. But at least, though, you know, the technology is extensible. right? You know, and why I like this technology is that unlike some methods of microscopy where you only see three colors and that's it. You can never go beyond that, or 10 or 12, whatever it is, or some only one, actually. This, you can potentially, you know, as long as your imagination can help you build a tag, you might be able to label it and hunt it down and find out where it is. Also, this is really, really cheap, so it's, it, and it doesn't take much time. So it's really easy to try. And um, you know, many, many groups have written to me and just said, oh, yeah, you know, this undergrad in our group tried it out, worked on the first try. You know, we're starting to get data. And so, if you do try it out and you miss something, well, OK, you know, it's, it's exploratory, but it doesn't require a huge investment. And that's also important when doing high risk, high reward kinds of research. So the Church Lab, about a year ago, and also a group in Sweden, the Nielsen Group, about a year before that, published papers on what they call in situ sequencing. So the basic idea is take a cell, anchor the RNA or DNA or whatever you want to sequence to um, you know, the, the molecules inside the cell, so they're stuck. And then basically do what's called sequencing by synthesis. So the sequencing by synthesis is basically that concept that we were just talking about. So you have your piece of DNA, you want to sequence it. So what you do is you add four bases, each with a different fluorophore, blue, green, red, and infrared. And let's suppose that you have an A here. Um, oh, sorry, suppose you have an A coming in to bind, and that's red, let's say. So it will, it will come here, and that this little dot will look red for a while. And then you destroy all the fluorophores by bleaching it, by shining bright light on it. Or maybe you cut off the fluorophore. And now you wash in another one. And suppose the next base that comes in is T, and it's blue. So now the same dot, the same dot that you saw that was red earlier, now it's blue. And so over time, you, you take a movie, and the dots will change color. Blue, red, blue, green, blue. Red, 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 blue, purple, whatever. And so by doing this reaction many times in a row, a dot will change its color, and you can read it over time. So what we're doing now is working on incorporating these sequencing methods into the expanded state, which is important, too, because by making more room around these tags, we think the sequencing will go better. Right now, the sequencing is pretty low yield, because when you're in the cell, it's so compact, right? There's so much stuff there. In answer to the first question, can we watch it expand and look at the, you know, the properties? You can do that. We haven't tried it, though. Um, and to answer your second question, are you, are you asking whether the brain can be alive after the expansion? Or So far, we cannot figure out how to do this in the living brain. Because uh, even if you could keep the, the cells alive after expansion, everything will be so far apart. They will not signal properly. Right. So it's an interesting question, though. I mean, an idea that we have had is take a brain, expand it, map stuff, and then could you shrink it back down again? 
And would it run again? I don't know. That's a very <laughs> interesting question. But um, uh, it's, a, it's interesting to, get to think about that, right? You can imagine taking a brain, map, expand it, map it, upgrade a few key receptors, you know, by add, putting in receptor 2.0, shrink it back down, and now you have like an upgraded brain. But I don't know. This is, gonna go, this is going on the internet, right? <laughs> Just kidding. No, no, I think it's a fun idea. And actually, we thought it also could you like, you can imagine expanding a brain and then bringing in like computer chips or you know, digital parts and then shrinking it back down again and seeing if you can make a digitally upgraded brain.